The second lecture is the assessment of a potential living donor. The objectives of this talk is to discuss the benefits of living donation, the donor and recipient perspective, identifying potential living donors and assessing live kidney donors, contraindications for living donation. Living kidney donation is a valuable source with a shortage of diseased kidney donors and a growing waiting list. Patients with potential kidney donors will wait shorter to receive a kidney and they will avoid the long waiting times of the transplant list. Patients with potential donors will have a better chance for preemptive transplantation. They might avoid dialysis with, it, with its complications and psychological trauma. There are specific advantages of living donation over disease kidney transplantation. Living kidney donation has better patient and graft survival. Living donation, because it's, of, it's the nature of, of it being an elective surgery, is suitable for clinically and immunologically complex cases. Living donation gives a chance to optimize the recipient and their medical condition and also knowing the quality of the organs to be transplanted. In certain cases and certain recipient, getting the immunosuppression in target might be difficult. With the living donation, it's, in, it's possible to give the immunosuppression days before transplantation to get to the level required. Living donation has a minimal cold ischemia time compared to diseased donation and the cold ischemia time ha may, might have effects on delayed graft function and long-term graft function. From the recipient perspective, living donation has better outcome than diseased donor kidneys, independent of the LHA matching. Living donation is an option for preemptive transplantation avo and avoiding dialysis. And if the recipient is already on dialysis, identifying a potential donor for the patient means that they don't have to wait long waiting time for diseased kidney. It's an elective plan procedure with less disruption to work and lifestyle and commitments. From the donor perspective, Living donation has huge emotional benefit, saying that, that they can help their loved ones. And they are keen to know the benefits of that. But also they are, should be aware of the risk that could affect them on the long term. The type of surgery and which kidney will be removed and the length of the hospital stay. They, will, they are also interested to know when they will be able to return to work, to travel and to drive. There were significant practice changes in the UK over the last 10 years which helped to increase the number of living donation. Not just doubled, but I think it actually tripled, tripled reaching more than 1,000 living donation in 2009 and 10. The law has changed in 2006 to allow altruistic and bare donation, which we will discuss in details. And in 2012, di directed altruistic donation is also legal provided there is no payment involved. In many transplant centres, there was expansion of the APO incompatible programmes and HLA incompatible transplantation. Also one of the targets for, trans for the transplant task is to increase the preemptive transplantation. All these changes and Practice in practice aim to increase and encourage more living, living donation. As we mentioned in the previous lecture, the types of living donors could be related, genetically related or emotionally related, like spouse, friends and neighbours. It could be direct donation or indirect 
if there is EDA only compatibility or HLA after desensitization. Altruistic donation could be directed or non directed. Pair pool donation means that couples or pairs who um, want to donate to each other but they can't because of either EDA or compatible or HLA, HLA incompatibility or both, they can be registered in a pair pool where they can swap or exchange kidney anonymously between other pairs. The registry is, is kept with the NHSBT in the UK since 2006. They run four matches per year, which is every three months, to include the new coming comers for the pair pool and see if there is a match identified. And if there is, then the operation will be carried out and arranged simultaneously to avoid withdrawal of any pair or couple. In 2007, the two-way matching runs has been going smoothly, and in 2008, the three-way has been introduced to benefit more recipients. Non-directed altruistic donation should occur anonymously. However, that could be broken after donation with consent and with coordination and arrangement to by the by the donor team. Altruistic donors have the option now to donate to the pair pool to open a chain which is called the domino chain. As I mentioned directed altruistic donation could also occur as long as there is no payment involved. Altruistic donors usually altruistic don donors um, usually donate to the high priority patient on the trust fund donor list. But if there is no high priority patient they can wait and they can donate to the long waiting patients on the paired list. And that could free up their potential donor that could donate to another patient on the disease list. And that's what we call chain and will benefit more recipients. If we look at the live donor pathway from referral, they should be the donor should be seen by the live donor coordinator early on to to uh, go through um, initial test and past medical history. They should have blood group and tissue typing to filter and triage unsuitable donors. Medical assessment, including investigation, imaging, to identify medically fit donors, followed by surgical assessment. And when they are surgically fit, they should receive an independent assessor, which is not as required as before now. And the role of the independent assessor to make sure that the relation between the donor and the recipient is genuine. Then a date is set for surgery and final cross match seven to ten days prior to surgery should be carried out. The patient would have a donor nephrectomy, whether that's open or laparoscopic and assisted. And then long term follow up should be arranged annually. The role of the live donor coordinator is to identify potential donors, screen by doing blood group and tissue typing. Primary country indication should be identified early on, so the NHS resources should not uh, are not wasted with uh, by working up many donors at the same time. Any drug history, ethical issues, any clear contraindication should be identified early on before further investigations. Donors should have protein, bloods, urine analysis, type 2 um, assess for proteinuria and hematuria. Patients should be given written and oral information, which is part of their consent. They should have verbal and written consent. The tissue typing report that would come from the recipient and the donor would have the blood group, the HLA match, 
and any anti antibodies actually antibodies which is unacceptable or ac or acceptable for the donors between the donors and the recipient to proceed with direct donation there should be negative cross match between the donor and the recipient legal and ethical issues should be identified there should be shouldn't be any remuneration for donors by the recipient for loss of earnings it's illegal however it is legal for the donors to receive reimbursement for loss of earning from the nhs or the primary care to encourage more donors consent is essential part of living donation independent assessor report to evidence the relationship between the donor and the recipient and its good practice it is important to be aware that a potential donor can withdraw at any time if they're right they should be also aware that the assessment process might bring them bad news about their health and might have implication on their insurance employment and future the, the results of the investigation should be kept confidential from the potential recipient ideally the team who should walk up the potential donor sh should not be involved in the care of the recipient to avoid conflict of interest the assessment of the donor should include past medical history drug history long-term use of anti non-stroke anti-inflammatory uh, drugs as an exome could be a relative contraindication if the donors cannot come off it surgical history could and family history could be important also social history habits like smoking alcohol obstetric history including preeclampsia gestation diabetes all these could have implication on the assessment that could turn down a potential donor other particular important points in the past medical history of the donor is the hematuria proteinuria and recurrent urinary tract infections history of recurrent urinary stones could be potential contraindication history of diabetes hypertension diabetes is contraindication for kidney donation hypertension depends on the presence or absence of end organ damage and the number of antihypertension and antihypertensive the donor on histories of ischemic heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, thromboembolic disease and bleeding tendency, weight change and change in bowel habits also could have implication of turning down a donor. History of previous blood transfusion, jaundice, infections and previous cancer. History of a systemic disease that could involve the kidney like lupus. History of prior alcohol or current alcohol dependence or drug other drug dependence. Psychiatric history and the psychiatric medication, for example, lithium and its effect on the kidney, could be a point that would turn a donor down. All these should be discussed on an individual basis with the donor and the recipient depend on the severity of the condition previous anatomic problems also the donor should be asked about the national screening test like cervical smear mammography family history of renal condition that could affect the donor for example the fam strong family history of kidney disease especially in recipients and donors from the Asian subcontinent where CKD and diabetes is prevalent also family history of diabetes and premature death and malignancy should be considered and assessed during examination of the potential donor it's essential to assess the weight BMI blood pressure peripheral pulses and vascular disease urine tips pick for hematuria and proteinuria urine ACR or PCR or 24-hour collection 
should be done at least twice to assess for post-pneumonia. Examination of the cardiovascular system and respiratory system to, uh, to find or rule out any abnormalities. Examination of abdominal masses or hernias and lymphadenopathy. Asking the patient if there is regular self-examination of breast and self-examination of testes for male donors. After examination, routine blood tests including full blood count, kidney function, liver function test, bone and coagulation screen should be carried out. Virology, including if termed by virus, CMV and HIV, toxoplasma and tripolymer. Random blood glucose and fasting blood sugar should be done. Thyroid function test if there is strong family history of thyroid disease. And pregnancy should be excluded in female donors in the childbearing period. Men above the age of 60 should have prostatic specific antigen to rule out the cancer of the prostate. If there is abnormality in the fasting blood sugar, glucose balance test should be done, which means if the fasting blood glucose between 6.1 and 7 millimole. Individual from the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia and Caribbean should have glucose levels test as well done for them as part of the assessment. Donors with high BMI more than 34 and donors with family history, direct family history of type 2 diabetes should also undergo glucose tolerance test to rule out potential diabetes. They should undergo ECG, chest x-ray and x-ray of the urinary tracts and renal ultrasound to rule out any masses. The accurate measure of the kidney function in the isotopic ADTA GFR and the minimum acceptable GFR according to prediction curves is what will leave the patient or the donor at the age of 80 with a minimum of 37.5 ml per minute. According to the these curves on graph of these curves, which the donor should be lying between. Converting that to numbers, donors up to the age of 46 should have a minimum GFR, as to GFR of 80 ml per minute, while donors up to the age of 80 should have a minimum of isotopic GFR of 50. max re is an isotopic scan to um, assess the split kidney function, but it also tells about the kidney secretion of the isotope and if there is VUJ dysfunction. CT angiogram or MRI, MRA of the renal arteries and veins assessing the renal vessels and anatomy to see if there is multiple vessels which could be potentially difficult for the surgeon to remove the kidney. Extra cardiovascular or pulmonary test investigations should be done if clinically indicated, like echo, cardiovascular stress test and respiratory function test. These are the indications for doing an echo. For example, old age, history of hypertension, cardiac murmurs, or symptomatic patients, patients with hypercholesterolemia, patients with cardiomegaly on chest x-ray, and patient with high cardiovascular risk, more than 10%. Also, patient with high BMI should all undergo echo. 24 hours antibiotic blood pressure monitoring should be done if there is more than one reading with a blood pressure above 140 over 90. And the minimum accepted on the 24 hour antibiotic blood pressure is an average of, 20, of 125 over 80. Exercise tolerance tests should be done to assess suspected coronary artery disease and if there is any abnormalities, the donor should not be considered. Cardiac stress testing include maybe scan, pallium or echo with the butamine could be done to assess suspected coronary artery disease or if the patient cannot perform the exercise tolerance test. If there is any suspect of untreated 
skin color is easy. Or asymptomatic coronary artery disease, the donor should not be considered. Here is an absolute contraindication for living donation. By significant resistant hematopochinuria more than 20, 250 micrograms per day. Patient with urological problem that could increase the risk of CKD post donation, like re recurrent urinary stones and recurrent UTI. Patient with diabetes mellitus. Patient with cardiovascular disease, vascular disease, significant vascular disease, untreated symptomatic or asymptomatic coronary artery disease, dilated cardiomyopathy. Patient with significant treat untreated arrhythmias. And patient with significant vulvar disease. Patient with hypertension with end organ damage and patient with controlled hypertension on three antihypertensives. Patient with history of cancer in the last two years and certain types five years. Patient with active substance abuse is a contraindication. Unpregnant donors should be should do, should not donate. Potential donors do um, currently pregnant should not donate. There are other relative contraindications which are sometimes difficult. BMI of 34 patients on more than two antihypertensive to control their blood pressure, family history of strong family history of kidney disease, depending on the type of the primary disease, and these should be discussed on individual basis. Family history of renal cell cancer or breast cancer also could be a relative contraindication. Other comorbidities with the donors like pulmonary, significant pulmonary disease, COPD, previous history of stroke or TIA indicating significant vascular disease, patient with bleeding tendency or patient with anesthetic allergy. Old age alone is not an absolute contraindication, but also as the potential recipient um, will have more comorbidities as they get older, the same for the donor. The older donor will have more comorbidities and that might turn them down, on, down as a potential donor. Old age increases risk of preoperative complication. However, the donor of kidney function rather than the age is, is the definite determinant of the outcome of the assessment. As I mentioned in my previous lecture, the oldest UK altruistic donor, living donor, was 84 year old. After assessment and surgical assessment, if the patient is um, ready to receive from the potential donor. An important question that usually comes to mind is the patient on the transplant routine list, when to suspend them from the transplant list. From our survey we did at Preston, where we send questionnaire to all the transplant centers in transplant units in the UK, we found that most of the centers will suspend the potential recipient or the potential donor when the theatre date is set for them, followed by the option of, to, um, of suspending the patient after finishing the donor assessment. Thank you for listening to me today.